So hello, everyone. Uh, we're very excited to be here today. I'm here on behalf of the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine Regulatory Affairs Committee as a representative of that committee to have a nice discussion today. And we're gonna, we really want to include the audience in this discussion about regulatory convergence. And we, we understand that this is really just a start uh, to the conversation. So we're going to try to set uh, 10 minutes aside at the end of the meeting to take your questions. And we just point out that um, questions should be reflective of your questions regarding convergence and not project-specific questions. So I wanted to just really say that um, it is my pleasure to be a part of the ARM Regulatory Affairs Committee. The, there was a subgroup of us who really worked on this. And I put this slide first to just say that it's a group effort. We're a great group. We work really well together. So a lot of people had input into this. And what we did is we designed a survey of our members to ask them how we are doing in this space. And so we used that survey to set the goals for today's panel session. So essentially what we wanted to do is engage regulatory leaders and industry leaders in a conversation around what's already happening with regard to convergence. And I have to say, it's been really great to be a part of this meeting to see that regulatory is being talked about as a motivator, a mover, and not an impediment. So it's been just wonderful to be part of that. And also to say that what we'd like to do as an RMRAC committee is continue our efforts to move these conversations forward and to advance convergence in this space. And so what we, we wanted to do is to talk about some of the areas that we saw where convergence might be useful and to get some reaction to that and to help us prioritize where we might work. So I'm gonna have our panelists um, introduce themselves as we start the session, but we do have folks from um, both uh, consulting, from the standards coordinating body and other work, and both from the health authorities um, whom you're probably well uh, aware of. So we're going to start in the convergence area. And I stole this from the CBER website where we wanted to just make sure that we, you understand that when we're talking about harmonization, we're actually talking about having the same set of standards across regulatory bodies. But what we, re what we really want to do is talk about convergence, which is a much more gradual process where we can have conversations about things that are impediments and really be moving toward the concept of harmonization. So that's where we'll focus today. So the first question we asked our ARM Regulatory Affairs Committee members was, what's happening in this space? What are the existing efforts that are moving us toward a cooperation, convergence, and harmonization? So I wanted to highlight a few of these. We, we um, you know, tried to put these together into categories. In the international space, there is an International Pharmaceutical Regulators Forum. This is a group that actually this year issued a reflection paper about biodistribution. And with sort of general principles that they felt were applicable across all major regions. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. I think one of the things that's been fascinating about that is the fact that at, shortly after they issued that reflection paper, <coughs> The EU updated their guidance on gene therapy, which upgraded their standards for biodistribution, and FDA issued their long-term follow-up guidance, which contains their latest recommendations on biodistribution. So you can see how hard it is to have uh, one um, standard. Regionally, there's a lot of work ongoing um, across the EU and US, as well as with the European Commission to standardize in the uh, EMA. And then uh, for trade associations, obviously, we're here representing ARM. And we'll have, we have a representative on our panel to talk about um, the standards body's uh, work. So our first question for our panelists was to um, select a <laughs> convergence effort in which they are involved and to give us some background about their work in that space. So Joanna, I'll start with you. If I can say for a while. Um, sure, thank you, Melody. Um, I think we, I'm here representing standards coordinating body. I will also touch on the APEC uh, advanced therapy cluster or priority work area PWA. Um, so standards coordinating body SCB is really what we do is, is a coordinating coordinating efforts of standards from upstream, downstream, upstream development to downstream education implementation. How do we do it? Um, 
two main focus areas, right? One is about the processes. And this is where actually we were very fortunate to be able to, with our partners, Nexite, to get a, 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 a contract from the FDA starting um, September 20, uh, 2017 to develop sets of processes about identification, prioritization, feasibility of assessment of standards development, and eventually bring it all together as a roadmap. Um, and also, as we have done so much work uh, within this area, uh, act, the contract has been extended to March next year. We were able to deliver all the, the reports um, that captured the process, how the process should be, and all the stakeholders should be engaged to implement, uh, you know, adopt the process to make this process more efficient. The other aspect I think is equally important is about technical project, uh, um, technical standards projects that we're working on. Uh, so in using the processes that the SP can really engage the stakeholders to identify the key topics that you know the, the industry and academic, the whole community should be working on. And if you go to the SCB website, you will be able to see uh, the you know some of the active projects we're working on. And with the extension of the, the contract from the FDA, actually we're gonna have a workshop January 14th, 15th to talk about the standards, the exercise, the processes, but also the, some of the standards projects that we're working on I would really encourage um, everybody to be able to participate. But I want to quickly to bring back to why standards is important about convergence. Uh, I think standards for a lot of people is not, um, Coming from farm, Bell Pharma, automatically we want to think about regulatory guidelines, ICH, FDA guidance, et cetera. But standards actually is really an important piece to be able to help advance convergence. I think it is unique for our area. If you look at globally, not all the countries, actually it's really just a handful of countries currently have comprehensive regulatory framework about how to regulate advanced therapy products. So when there is no uh, comprehensive regulatory framework available yet in globally, the standards are really a very nice tool to be able to get everybody together to have a common language and work it towards eventually the convergence. That's one piece of it. The other piece is based on our work or engagement with the SDO like ISO. Convergence or harmonization, eventually we want to see uh, end products like guidance, et cetera. But actually, working on some of the standards projects like ancillary materials, it's the process is equally important. It took us four years to eventually finally going to get the three documents on standard material uh, requirements published by the end of the year. And it's interesting to hear about, you know, now we're going to adopt the ATMP term. For us, even just agreeing on whether to use ancillary materials or raw materials, it was a big debate among all different global experts. So what I'm trying to emphasize is this exercise along the way to bring all the stakeholders together to, debate, to, 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 to discuss and debate and eventually come to conclusion and a consensus about the common language, the common practices, that's really what matters in the end. Also, in, together with the final end products. I will stop here and then, you know, let other people speak. And Juan, I think the other thing is the work you did to actually catalog all the existing standards is a major contribution to the field. Because although you, know, you, you knew that different organizations had standards, there's actually now a deliverable that was issued that, that goes through a list of all existing standards. I think that's a major contribution to the field. Thank you. Dr. Yeah. Marks, is there anything you wanted to add on the SCB piece? I think we're very happy that with that collaboration. <laughs> Great. Um, Dr. Murayama, mm -hmm. would you like to talk about your activities on any one of these uh, convergence efforts? Well, well uh, actually, uh, we also commit to the uh, IPRP or ICH and then APEC things. But uh, basically, uh, <coughs> So this uh, cell therapy uh, product is very uh, new uh, area, so we don't have any experience yet. So that's why uh, we combine together, then talk about uh, experience, learning, 
that's very important for that for us. And then the, actually, uh, US or Korea had a lot of uh, product is already approved, so they have uh, experience for the reviewing. And also, Japan has just four product, but still, see the Asian country that they don't have any approved product, so they want to run it for us. So that's very important to start information sharing. So that's, uh, I think, the basically important for the, this uh, area. Yeah, Thank very you. important. Thank we, you. We recognize that. Anthony, you're here to help represent. I would actually ask you to introduce yourself. <laughs> and uh, Anthony kindly agreed to help us with the EMA portion of our session, given that we were unable to get some of the <laughs> regulatory, uh, regulatory folks who are at the CAT meeting to, to attend today. So Anthony, introduce yourself and tell uh, folks a little bit more about some of the convergence efforts you see in, in the EU region. Yeah, so I'm, I'm a, a regulatory, EU regulatory consultant, um, and uh, we help a number of uh, uh, clients coming over, particularly into the EU, um, often for the first time as well. Uh, so what we see uh, quite a lot of is um, uh, companies, those that have got good experience coming into Europe for the first time, and those that are doing it, um, so those that haven't, uh, uh, coming before and those that have got good experience. So we see uh, quite a variance in uh, experience coming, o coming over the pond. Um, and one of the things that uh, uh, strikes me when we're thinking about convergence, we're often talking about you know, Europe, Japan, America. Well, actually we still have convergence efforts as well in that regional area and it's interesting to see that you know, that's, that's obviously needed in, in various areas in the world. In Europe, we um, have been on a 20-year adventure uh, with EMA and obviously the, the EU. Uh, we've seen uh, great strides forward in bringing these national agencies together uh, to the point that we have these centralised procedures. This is obviously old news, but uh, uh, to some degree, uh, we, we still see interactions at the national level uh, where we have procedures that diverge somewhat. And if we take one example, uh, just from the point of view of clinical trial applications, um, you still get some variance at the national, national level. And so the convergence is an evolution. And so what we're seeing is that um, with things like the clinical trial regulation, which is uh, slightly delayed for a local skirmish and some uh, uh, other matters, um, we are, we, we're starting to see um, agencies going again and trying to improve um, the existing procedures and trying to see what you can bring in, uh, to a central level and what needs to stay still at a national level and keep going again until you can find commonality. The question would then be how you extend that out you know, across um, intercontinentally. Uh, and I, I think we'll, we'll probably touch on other areas where uh, there's, uh, there's scope for continued convergence at the national level as well. Absolutely. Dr. Marks, can you uh, give us a few comments about yeah. activities you're involved in? Yeah, so we, we, we're, we're, we're active both with the ATP cluster, both there's a cell therapy and a gene therapy aspect to that, as well as in, in conversations with the European Commission. I just want to echo something that Anthony said. One of the challenges for us, it's wonderful to have these multilateral discussions um, it's hard when a given region, in, in, in this case Europe in some cases, is not yet settled on its, um, on its structure for certain things. We are still kind of, there's a little bit of a challenge still dealing with the hospital exception in, in Europe. If, if those of you who don't know what that is, basically um, it allows hospitals to make a given therapy without needing to go through the national procedures or for the centralized procedure, for instance, that a normal gene therapy would, would go through. So, it, with a hospital exception, a given hospital could be making a gene therapy and using it, whereas there is, it, there is a requirement in the European regulations, and correct me if I'm wrong, for, uh, for gene therapies to go through the centralized procedures. There's a list of products that have to go through the centralized procedure. Um, so, um, we, we're, but we're very anxious to try to um, have as much harmony as we can, and, and I think 
we learn from it as, and I think it's it's a it's a great exchange with uh, the U.S., Japan, uh, Health Canada, um, uh, EMA. Um, we and we really that we sometimes find that we have differences that once we understand what the science is behind them, we can try to iron them out. Um, uh, sometimes it's not easy, but I think we, we, we understand that if we want people to be able to develop products globally, particularly for rare indications, we're going to have to try to come to some kind of convergence because it's, it's, not, it's not possible, uh, unlike large markets like cardiovascular disease, where it, you, FDA has been known to say, well, you need to do another study, or EMA will say, well, you need to do another study. In, in this case, it's just not reasonable uh, to do that, either for clinical endpoints and also more so uh, it, it's very challenging when we have different manufacturing requirements. So we, we, we do see the need for convergence there. It's not perfect yet. I'm the first to acknowledge that. Um, but we, we really understand and it, uh, that, that it's necessary. And, and in, in fact, as recently as about two or three weeks ago, I met with Guido Razzi and we discussed the need that, that this is something that we'll have an ongoing dialogue about um, uh, and, and probably more to come in terms of uh, documents that may be, re be released that, that will be between uh, the, at least the U.S. and EMA. Great. And I think, I think that is one of the things that we... Um, you know, we don't. We have insight to the fact that these meetings occur, but we have very little insight into the topics that are discussed. And that was, I think, one of the questions that some of our members had related to: how much of that can we find out, or is that something that, from your perspective, these topics are really just advanced, sort of at you know, bef shortly before you go into that meeting? So it's not something where we could have some sort of insight into the. Um, topics that you're at least uh, conversing about. I think we're very interested in hearing what people need to hear about, and those are the things we need to speak about. That's so, what <laughs> um, uh, so uh, I, I don't, I don't have any problem with uh, that. And, and to the extent that we're all about transparency, and I think actually, it, it seems to me that our European colleagues have talked about transparency just like we have. Uh, I don't have any problem. Um, uh, there's, there's at least I, I, nothing that I've said or that, we, you know, that I spoke about with Guido is something that I wouldn't mind telling anyone here. We didn't make tremendous progress on resolving things, but we made uh, a significant commitment to realizing that having different, it, having different policies creates just, it, it creates so much of a strain on developers, particularly, and, and it hurts those companies that are trying, that are kind of in, in the worst possible position those that are working in very small populations that may be uh, challenged already with, with their manufacturing. So uh, we understand that. And acknowledging that you have those meetings is just such a wonderful thing for us to know that, that that's happening and that's a, a common message that we heard today. Um, I think one of the questions I'm going to throw out for audience engagement later is the concept of whether there is anything missing from this list that you're aware of that you think we should add to our list. Um, and so when we get to that portion of the session, I'll have you do that. Our last question related to these uh, harmonization convergence efforts really had to do with whether it is time to converge at an ICH level. Um, we know that there used to be a gene therapy working group at ICH, um, which was disbanded. And many of the working documents that are available on the ICH website are very old. And so we were asking Dr. Marks and Dr. Mariyama to comment about whether they think um, the time is right or the time is not right to um, try to advance things through the ICH uh, system. Would you like to start? I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say that, I, okay, I, I'm happy to say that what, one of the issues here, it, it's, it's a challenge because it would be nice to have harmonized guidance on cell and gene therapies at this point. I think one of the problems that, and I, I, I was gonna say it, but I ran out of time, so I'll say it now. The guidance suite that I just showed you that, that has six guidances on it, we're going to have more guidances. And those six guidances on that list, I'm sure that we'll finalize them in the next year. But within a couple of years, they're going to be out of date. And this is the problem in this area is we're moving so quickly um, that, that we are trying to change, for me at least, as a leader of our small portion of the FDA, we're trying to, we have to kind of retool how we're essentially in continual learning mode because, you know, we had CRISPR editing for DNA 
two years ago, three years ago. Now we have CRISPR editing for RNA. Now we have CRISPR editing single nucleotides. Just keeping up with the pace of things is really a challenge. And one of my concerns with trying to, uh, uh, unless we find some really basic things that we can agree on for gene therapy for uh, ICH, it takes to get something from step one through step five of ICH through the multilateral process takes several years. And by the time it, it just would, it would seem like a waste of energy to put all this effort into something that when it's done is stale. You know, it, 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 it just seems like, uh, you know, it, I, I, to, I, I, a, a very long run for, you know, for a very short leap. So it may be that in a few years we'll be more ready for that. And it may be that we can find some narrower areas where we find to move forward in, 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 in gene therapy guidance for, for ICH. But I don't see a broad swath of different guidances from ICH at this point. I'm, I'm happy to defer. I mean, I, just any other thoughts? <laughs> well. Uh... On the other hand, uh, ICH also wants to do the, some topic on the, this area because this area is very hot. So <laughs> that's why uh, ICH also uh, asking to the uh, what the topic of the Absolutely. cell therapy product. Yeah. So uh, I think that the gene therapy things or the uh, bio distribution or uh, you know the we in Japan is uh, actually propose the tumor genetic testing for that ICH guideline. But uh, I think uh, uh, you know that uh, this this area is very new. So I think uh, the term for the discussion is very maybe longer. So still we think uh, to sharing the information because we have a lot of experience and then the uh, farm uh, concept uh, measure also uh, they doing the. Uh, validation study for the tumor genetic testing. So that's very good to start uh, to sharing the information. But uh, I think the, uh, still we think about, we need to discuss the fair is the uh, best place to discuss in the, this topic. And I think it's a yeah. great thing for us to hear is, you know, I think one of our tenants when we first started working in this area is, was that we wanted regulatory flexibility. And yet now to be saying we want regulatory harmonization, actually in some ways there's that scale of we want flexibility, we want convergence or harmonization. So can I, can I tag along actually two key elements, right? One is fast, um, very evol evolving very fast. But meanwhile, on the other hand, we also like to have a platform to be able to share knowledge, share best practices. I think that's not trying to advocate uh, standards, but I think that's where we try to uh, have a platform and have a process to say, hey, let's, maybe we can just start from white paper, right? Have some common language being discussed, being uh, eventually reached consensus, and we gradually move on to the next stage about you know, technical specification. Eventually, when we're ready, we can develop standards. So, you know, different tools we can utilize to have the, the, the convergence. Great. Well, we're going to move on to part two, which really was about um, asking our regulatory affairs uh, professionals to identify what they considered to be high impact topics for convergence. So essentially here, there are a few things that we talked about. Um, the fact that there's already guidance in maybe at, at, at times three of the major regions. Um, or the fact that having consistency would avoid duplication of effort or make the process much uh, smoother for us. So when we got our survey results back, what we did is to bucket those into quality aspects, which you see there, non-clinical aspects, clinical and procedural. Now I will just stop to tell you that we had a massive amount of <laughs> things that got submitted. So we, what we really had to do was look at those that rose to the top as being the most commonly um, referenced. So this isn't everything, but this is certainly our top pick lists in those categories. And I highlighted in green under procedural the GMO requirements because um, that has really already been work that the Regulatory Affairs Committee in the EU has, has really spearheaded and there's been great things that have been going in the right direction with regard to GMOs. So as we as a Regulatory Affairs Committee look to setting our agenda for the 2019 
I think it would really be helpful um, to us to have your reflection and feedback on which of the items on this list that you think are the most ripe for uh, us to advance as a priority for convergence. Maybe we'll start with you, Anthony. Um, well, it's interesting, uh, the idea of what's ripe to uh, go for in the first instance um, uh, might not always be the easiest as well. Um, so bringing the point of, uh, that I was making earlier about the, the sort of national aspect within, within the EU, again taking this EU-centric point of view, we know uh, that the uh, GMO um, situation in the EU uh, and, and the procedures uh, can cause delays to, to CT, uh, uh, CTAs. Um, uh, but that's partly because we have a, a diverse set of requirements at the national level and um, how, how each nation uh, is set up to handle that process. Now, on the one hand, uh, that's, I think that makes this a, a useful uh, topic to, uh, for you to be uh, looking at because um, I think uh, the developers uh, you know, are feeling some pain there. Um, obviously, people are getting through. They're moving their products through into development more and more uh, through clinical development. Um, but there are some significant challenges in moving through um, uh, the CTA with the national requirements on the GMO applications as well. So, because this is not a centralised procedure, obviously you've got to go at this at a national level, which makes it challenging. However. I think you know using um, uh, the, the the might of the various organisations to try and have a forum for discussion, to identify and bring out best practice that you see across uh, various nations, rather than just looking at the negatives, looking at the positives of what some countries have been doing to simplify their own processes at a national level, is very worthwhile. Now, how you pull about that uh, uh, that that discussion, whether that can be assisted at the uh, centralized level as well, just to facilitate discussion would be helpful. But if we, if we take a few, a few examples, um, um, a couple of years ago, uh, France made change to allow parallel submissions of uh, um, GMO applications and clinical trial applications. That was a massive move forward uh, that you know, we've seen a number of clients benefit from. Um, Understanding what can and can't change and, and, and seeing whether um, uh, we, we can at least express what's causing concern will be helpful. And, and, and if, if we identify some, uh, some points that at a national level there are so many bodies that are sometimes involved in some countries. So um, those countries that have good communication between the bodies, uh, we, you know, we see uh, the process is moving further forward. Um, and so you know, how, how you can encourage a, a nation to change its attitude is, is very difficult, but you can at least um, express this. And there have been countries that have, have, have uh, a setup that appears to be that little bit more straightforward, whether it is with the um, authority responsible for CTAs having some form of control or great communication or increased communication with the other bodies involved. I think having a forum that at least maps this out individually, I think, as organizations and, and, and clearly from our perspective as consultants to help our clients, we map this out. We, we try and uh, figure this out into the development plan so that we, we raise it up ahead of time so that we can move forward practically. Um, but a greater awareness um, and ability to talk about these matters may lead to some change. I'm not saying it's easy, but I think it's <laughs> worthwhile. Great. And I think in the Q&A session, we can have some of our EU RAC members talk specifically about some of the work that they have been doing in that area. Um, Dr. Murayama, would you have uh, one of these oh, that you yeah. suggest we tackle? Actually, uh, I should mention about the GMP, GMO requirement, because uh, I think uh, after the Q&A session, may ask to <laughs> this uh, issue, because uh, in Japan has a law, for, uh, and then laws indicate the GMP, GMO requirement is 
uh, need to start before starting the clinical trial. So that's uh, actually uh, pe pe uh, people say that this is too much. I mean the too early. Because, but uh, actually, the basically, this requirement is uh, uh, sharing data and, and uh, environment uh, risk assessment. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, even before start the clinical trial, you can, you have uh, data for the shedding in the non-clinical part, or you can est estimate in the human shedding. So, actually, uh, it's not too much to stress our <laughs> us, but uh, you can, I think you can explain that before starting the clinical trial too. Yeah. Okay. So GMO yeah. and definitely yeah. the same same topic for <laughs> Japan. Yeah. <laughs> and I mentioned the chemogenicity before, but so uh, yeah, this topic is uh, we proposed in the, for the ICH for topic, ICH. but uh, again the. We need to still need to discuss the uh, where is the best place to discuss these chemodynasty. We we just want to know to try is uh, we have a uh, uh, experiments for the chemodynasty. We have a uh, lots of consultation for the uh, before the IND. So so uh, <coughs> academia person or sponsor will evaluate the tumogenicity for the, the product, especially uh, uh, IPSL or ESL-derived product. So, yeah, that's very uh, important uh, uh, hazard risk for that, this product. So, we, we have a, so we want, we want to try to the sharing this information to everybody. Yeah. That's all. <laughs> so, start uh, there. Yeah, yeah. yeah, start with what yeah. the different requirements are yeah. in the different regions. And I think yeah. everyone considers yours to be the toughest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think sharing would be extremely yeah. helpful. <laughs> Absolutely. Juan, would you like to show sure. us where you um, think we should go? I, actually, I agree <laughs> with Anthony's point about the high impact ones may not be the easier ones because uh, I remember uh, we had this uh, comparability session two years ago and we had a great discussion <laughs> but it's still hard to come up with some you know even general framework um, on the other hand I do think the comparability has to be based on counterization right so that's part of the the potency will belong to that one as well I do want to share uh, at SCB we are working on two active projects on one is a cell characterization that we eventually going through the ISO process and the other one is the bio uh, the, the, the scaffold uh, characterization for the tissue engineering products and then in that in those two projects we're going to talk about the potency as well but actually one important element we, we it came up is during a SCB arm uh, sponsored organized a workshop uh, about a couple of weeks ago uh, you know with stakeholder working meeting trying to say what's the best way to develop a potency and and some people were suggesting how about we come up with a mental model how exactly to to tackle this issue what questions to ask how to go through the process eventually leading to the to the potency so i think that those are all very important um, elements we need to consider uh, i do want to quickly touch on phase appropriate cgmp um, we don't have anything concrete but one important element again come up was about control strategy. Mm. Whether it's a control strategy during manufacturing process, or the control strategy using the analytics to control you know, the manufacturing process, or even just analytical methods, how the control strategy should be utilized, and, and eventually you know, really how this uh, phase appropriate CGMP requirements to be able to meet. So, so phase appropriate control strategy. Exactly, so yes. Mm. And I think that's how, Joanne, to your point, that's how, what, how we came up with potency, how to develop an assay. Because although there were a lot of comments about we would like potency, we, we have potency guidance already, we could have consistent potency guidance, but what we really found was what really is people are struggling with is for their very particular product type, 
how do they do this? Right. So I think that how to develop an assay is definitely, we settled on that as put, what we put on our slide because we felt that that's really at the heart of the question. It's not about, uh, we can't really answer this for every single product type, but we could, if we could develop a sense of how you would go about that, right? right? right. That, that could help sponsor. Exactly. And then Dr. Marks. So I, I think I'm gonna, gonna just echo the, the use of kind of, it may be reasonable at this point to think about, I, I like phase appropriate GMP expectations. I think that's one of the issues that I think vexes uh, the development of products is that you have things develop in academic laboratories mm -hmm. and they don't have a roadmap. They, they are lacking uh, essentially a roadmap of how to get them through to see the commercial product at the end. And I think that creates really challenges at some point. Some, some, it, some academic institutions do it better than others, but I, I wonder if even just a roadmap of, of what the appropriate uh, things to be considering about, uh, uh, about GMP expectations would be. I think sometimes people, because we're pretty, we're pretty generous about what people can do in the academic world when they make products for phase one studies. Um, and it, it, in, in some cases, the choice of whether something's made in someone's laboratory or something could be made by a contract manufacturer, it may seem, one way may seem less expensive in the short term, but it may turn out that it is ultimately um, detrimental to moving the product forward because you then end up having to transfer, again, transfer process. And unfortunately, we've seen one too many times where transferring process um, from one laboratory to another or one manufacturing facility to another leads also to loss or decrement of efficacy. So I think that's a place where I would, I would think about whether roadmaps there, and those might even incorporate um, how you might bring in, uh, you know, in process controls or potency assays uh, into, uh, into that. So I think that's one great place to focus. Hopefully one that could get to green pretty quickly on this list is the orphan sameness similarity standards. Um, I did a little homework. This came up. I saw this and I, we did a little homework <laughs> last night and it, it looks like this may be um, uh, uh, the, our, our European colleagues t and us talking past one another um, uh, because it seems like their standards for orphan sameness and similarity are actually, at least as of last night, and again, this is not definitive regulatory advice for the <laughs> EMA, this is based on uh, some back and forth conversation, is that they're, 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 the way they look at whether something is the same product or different from orphan purposes is very similar to ours, which is that our, our, our concept is that in general, if you have a given vector but you put in different inserts, those are different products. Um, uh, even if they're for the same, uh, targeted at the same disease, if the insert is different, vector the same, uh, we would consider those uh, potentially different orphan products. Same thing, if you had the same insert but different vectors, um, uh, those could be individual orphan products. And it sounds like that was their understanding as well. So I think we're going to have to just sort that one out and, and, and see um, whether at some level there was some disconnect, but hopefully that will get to green soon. And I think it is probably that we just don't have enough experience yet in this space um, to know exactly what it does mean. Uh, yeah, but this is a great place where I think it's a great question to ask, and it's actually one that we should be able to come to, uh, to come to, to clarification or clarity on pretty quickly. And I think that's part of, of, of something that has, I think, opened up in the past few years with, with FDA's increasing uh, efforts towards mutual reliance, mutual recognition uh, uh, on, on other in, in inspectorates. We've also come to have more conversations with our, uh, with our foreign regulatory counterparts, so hopefully that can get to clarity. Can I just pose a question to the audience, everybody? Like, if we are having trouble, challenges to establish comparability, what will be the standards for similarity? <laughs> Right? I mean, we are talking about it's so challenging to even establish comparability within our own facility manufacturer sponsor to implement process change. I, I, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit. To I talk agree. About I agree. <laughs> then how to define the similarity standards. Is it too early to know what all of those elements that impact upon similarity really are? Um, I would say that those who have come in the cell and gene therapy areas 
looking for, for biosimilarity on the biosimilars pathway, it's probably a little early in the game. In fact, <laughs> our guidances even note that. Um, uh, so, but I think it's, I mean, it, it'll be wonderful 10 years down the line when we're having that conversation. conversation. Um, but I think we're still a little early to be talking about biosimilars in this realm because it is, it's so hard to know. I mean, we've had people that want to sequence an entire, I mean, they want to give us you know, the sequencing of the entire organism. And I think your point is right. We still, it's, we still have to get to comparability protocols before we can get to similarity protocols. All right. Well, we've had a really ro robust um, discussion about the sort of low-hanging fruit. I think the other thing that it would be good to hear from the audience, and I would open up to our panelists, is whether there are things that you think that are actually high-impact topics that could, there could be more convergence on that our teams didn't identify um, in this sort of at, this really was the top th three to four in each category that were identified. Was there anything that you think is particularly missing that you think is a struggle that we haven't, we haven't characterized? And I think the audience, too, will be good to hear from you. If there's something you think we've missed with regard to uh, what makes it difficult for us to navigate global regulatory. I, I'll just say something from, from having come from a WHO meeting. And that is one of the things that probably we need to do um, as high-income countries is start to help our low- and middle-income country counterparts understand the nature of gene therapy. Because I think the, one of the things I was really impressed with was the passion that people had, for instance, those who are developing potential gene therapies for sickle cell disease or thalassemia. If you look at India, Africa, those are areas where we'll benefit. There are places where they don't even have the therapies, I mean, they don't have the supportive care that we have. Yet, gene therapy could be completely transformative. Those areas have very little understanding at this point about the nature of gene therapy. And starting to help with that effort, it's not something that's an alarm that has to be done this year, but it needs to start to happen because it's a complex concept. I mean, going to the patient engagement meeting this morning, and we, were, we sat at that together, yeah. many people in the United States don't understand that if you give a somatic cell gene therapy, you're not correcting the gene defect in all of your progeny, that it's just taking care of you. It's not germline gene editing. And many people don't understand that difference in the United States, let alone in places that have never heard of gene therapy. So I think that's one place I would just identify that. Doing that groundwork and helping our colleagues will, will be um, really important. I know it may not be the most exciting thing, perhaps, um, but um, from a global health perspective, it's, it's, I think it's good, good global citizenship. Yeah, and our, the ARM Foundation at that meeting, I, I, we were very impressed with the work that they're, it looks like they're starting to do on that, so that's wonderful. Um, Can I just yeah. quick, go yeah. ahead, Joanne. He wants to do something. <laughs> oh, we have a question already, come on. <laughs> So, so there's been a couple of discussions that touched on one. Sorry, sorry you GMO, GMO alignment. Sorry. There's that, the discussion around how different, different countries on a global basis beyond the small cohort of people who are trying to deal with these issues at the moment touched on the question and then the GMO question that was raised earlier touched on it, which is these are all really important elements of regulatory convergence. But I get the sense that underneath some of these are deeper seated philosophical differences between the way that these products are regulated, that they come out in these, they come out, these, these are sort of the symptoms of them, but there's some underlying, there's some underlying differences there, GMO one being one. Is that correct? And if so, what are, what are they from the panel's perspective? Anthony, did you want to talk to that at all? If you think there's any deep-seated um, like um, regional or country differences in the, the way they look at that aspect? I can just look at that in, in two parts. Um, the first part, I think, is that um, you, you mentioned a moment ago, it's about the initiatives that we go through uh, that increase an understanding of people's interpretation. Interpretation in regulatory particularly at the European level as you're moving across different uh, um, uh, countries, uh, it, it is, that can be the source of 
and people talking across each other to some degree or not entirely understanding exactly what somebody is looking for. But the, the more you find an opportunity to have those discussions or forum to be able to understand that, the better. Uh, in terms of the um, GMO requirements, just specifically, I think the issue here is you've got to look at where, where the entire GMO process stemmed from in the first place. It wasn't necessarily from the, the, the regulation of medicines. And that's where I think that, that a lot of the diver, um, divergence comes nationally. And so how do you rein that back, back in, uh, particularly around these innovative technologies that do need assistance to be able to move, uh, move them forwards. So uh, I, is there a deep-seated under, um, disagreement underneath? I don't think I'm answering that question, but I think it is identifying the fact that people have started from a different starting point in the first place, and maybe that is a source of a problem in the GMO space. Digging. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think let's just start taking questions. Yes, I have a question. Does this box work? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my question, I'd like to raise something that I think has been a great deal of uh, concern of those of us who use uh, human embryonic stem cells or human fetal derived cells um, in cell replacement therapies. And it is on our understanding that the, um, that the policies in the U.S. Are, seem to be slowly creeping backwards um, to the time before we had embryonic stem cell therapies um, available. And I wonder if you guys can comment on what you think from your different jurisdictions, what will happen in the future <coughs> with uh, some therapies that are already underway and uh, novel therapies that are being developed right now in Japan and the U.S. and all over the place using embryonic stem cells or fetal derived cells. Dr. Marx or Dr. Mariyama? So I, I mean I can, I can say from the perspective, look, I'm, 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 because I'm here representing the U.S. government, there's only so much I can say, but you, you should look around the country and see where you're living. Um, uh, and unfortunately, um, uh, un unfortunately, I think you, you characterize what's going on precisely correctly. Mm -hmm. um, we also find, we, we feel it as well, because you, you may be aware that um, uh, there has been criticism of the use of, for instance, the humanized mouse model uh, for investigating drug safety, um, which uh, is pretty interesting to me because this is a model which potentially can save lives. In, in, ten, in, in, in essence, we've shown that it can because there are certain uh, antibodies, when given to these mice, produce uh, the same allergic reactions that they do in man or woman uh, and uh, were not, would not be detected with a non-human primate model. Um, so we, we're pre we feel you know, that these things have value. Um, it, uh, it's something that's in waves and I would encourage you, I can't formally take a position, but I would encourage you to be, uh, to, to use your First Amendment freedoms liberally. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? Uh, is there, are there other people? I know in Japan. Yeah, uh, so the embryonic stem cell uh, derived product is uh, actually uh, uh, yeah, there is a lot. There was lots of uh, ethics uh, issue, but uh, we had a lot of discussion. Then, uh, actually, uh, uh, one uh, ES cell derived product in, is uh, already uh, we uh, accept the uh, uh, IND. So they will be uh, try to the clinical trial soon. Any other comments from the audience on Ah oh, Manel? <laughs> so this may be 
a step further. And you may have it on your conversions, I'm not sure. But we've heard so much uh, in this conference and other conferences about a gap or a misalignment between um, payers and approvals and what they're looking for. And so um, is there a way to converge you know, the expectations from what is being approved and what the expectations are, given that we already have approvals and there's going to be many more over the next very short period of time. So, so I, I can take that one from the, from the FDA, from the U.S. perspective, which is that um, I think thanks largely to Dr. Gottlieb, our commissioners, I think, leadership, we've we've tried to start to engage with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services earlier on um, as we see novel products coming uh, along uh, with the goal that they will, hopefully we can work with them to think about novel payment models that they can use. Um, and we'll continue to do that. It's already going on in the device world, just so you know. That model works well um, uh, in devices. Um, and it's a matter of trying to bring it, uh, bring some of this more into the uh, into the advanced therapy medicinal product world. Um, and so we'll, we'll continue to work, work in that direction. I don't know that that's a total solution here because of our commercial payer issue and, and, and uh, how that will work. It's, it's probably different, obviously, in, in where you have different health, you know, different health systems, where you have national health authorities, it's a different issue. <laughs> or maybe. And Anthony, I don't know if you want to take that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think uh, in terms of the in, in the EU, it's obviously uh, um, difficult to, to talk on behalf of so many different nations' uh, uh, models there. Um, I think it's going to be fascinating to watch this play out. And um, we're already seeing this playing out, you know, with the, uh, uh, the current CAR-Ts going, going through um, assessment through, uh, through Europe. Um, I think the, um, the the sooner we have discussion, uh, there's uh, uh, obviously uh, network discussions across the uh, HTAs around uh, around Europe. Uh, but again, they are diverse because these are national uh, national budgets at the end of the day. Uh, but I think it's a fascinating period that we're going through. I wish I could say more, but. Uh, <laughs> And when we prepped our panel for this question, because we knew that with reimbursement <laughs> being such a um, big topic of discussion at today's panel, that we would be getting the question about what regulatory could do to move the reimbursement bar. So Dr. Murayama, I don't know if you want to. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a specialist for that uh, reimbursement <laughs> thing, so I, don't, I, don't, I can't say uh, not, not to, uh, so much, but uh, actually, yeah. The cell therapy or this product is uh, yeah, quite uh, expensive product. So, and uh, you, uh, I think everybody knows that the uh, Cati, the Chimera, also now uh, we are reviewing. So they have the the pricing for the national health insurance issue is uh, <laughs> actually uh, uh, coming soon. I think. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, we, we, I had I don't have any. Uh, I'll say it. Can I just, uh, because I, I came from, I was at a G Healthcare before, so along the line about the device has been doing the parallel assessment, right? I, I do think, um, if I understand correctly about that, is there is a common, common elements or common endpoints about clinical utility. So whether it's a regulatory approval or payers, you know, there's, they want to look at the clinical utility both, from both parties. I, I wonder if something we need to look into for the advanced therapy as well is something common for both the regulators and the payers. Because regulators care about safety and efficacy, so payers care about something economical you know, impact. So whether there are some common element that we can you know, both can use, then maybe that, that could be the way that kind of advanced is a uh, convergence. Good suggestion. I have a comment. Okay. <laughs> From a clinical trial perspective, in, um, global studies uh, are ideal. Uh, however, in the US, uh, with the close communications with the agency, we're able to start the studies much sooner than, let's say, in Europe. 
before we can start any study in Europe, the protocol is already enrolled and we're waiting for the follow-up uh, term to complete for any filing. So my question is, uh, why wouldn't harmonized procedure for all these different countries work in Europe for um, clinical trials at least? I mean, forget about GMO. GMO is a thing on its own, but clinical trial approval is also very challenging in Europe. And how can we converge the two? Yeah, I, I uh, agree. I think uh, we see this a lot as well, uh, where we're doing a bit of backtracking on substantial amendments uh, mid-trial as we're going through, uh, or as, as trials are setting up, as we're getting slightly different responses through those countries that are quick to approve and those that are taking longer to assess and understand these particular products. So uh, we do, you're right, uh, we, we see uh, at the uh, CTA level uh, countries grouping into some of those that are a little bit more pragmatic and quicker to get to, uh, uh, started up, others that might be a little bit more onerous. Um, now we've got the uh, coming into force uh, in, in the future, the clinical trial regulation where we'd be uh, bringing together at least a central element to the clinical trial regulations. Um, we'll just have to see how that pans out over time. But I, I do agree that this is something that we see uh, as, a, as a challenge, uh, trying to align across, particularly with uh, trials in the States that have usually already started. Uh, at the point that they're coming into Europe for some of these programs. I, I, I take your point. And another uh, question that I have, especially when there's a protocol with a special protocol uh, approval from FDA, um, how can, uh, let's say, FDA and European regulators talk to each other so that whatever is approved under a SPA is not going to be reopened uh, during the clinical trial review period. I, I would suggest that if you're going to if you're going to get a spa from the FDA, that you probably ask for parallel scientific advice from both both agencies at the same time. That's that's the way to do yeah, that, it's and, and that 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 actually does work. It's, There's quite scientific advice during the protocol review period in each country Well, I can't fix that, but hopefully the uh, hopefully the CT hopefully the CT in 2020, if they don't delay it again, that will help that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, hello. Um, oh, go ahead. Sarah? Maria. Oh, hi, just, just a quick follow up on the CTA um, uh, in Europe. So we heard from the uh, CAT and EMA a couple of weeks ago, two updates uh, on that one. So in the meantime, that the clinical trial regulation is up to speed, they, they, they're getting like two new initiatives. I mean, one we will uh, get in a month time or so, the new guideline on investigational ATMP. So hopefully that will bring some alignment at the member state level. And the other one is this big project on the ATMP training curricula. So they, they really will roll over a very comprehensive uh, training to all the assessors in the m different member states and also inspectors uh, with also the idea on accelerating and consolidating uh, clinical trial applications uh, feedback. So hope this is um, um, uh, helping. In the meantime, we get the, the, ATMP, uh, the, the clinical trial regulation. Up to yeah, speed. more guidance coming, which is always good here for us. Bob, last question. Okay. <laughs> It's on the list here, but hasn't been discussed, and it's a fairly new area. Oh, thank you. It's a fairly new area for uh, consideration. It's the real-world experience in the types of data that are necessary to support new claims or indications. And so that real-world experience compared to registries and how is that information uh, going to be applied for uh, new claims and indications, and what's that level of uh, completeness that uh, across the globe would be acceptable. So I think that's an area that would be very helpful to look at. I think it's a, it's a great place for discussion. I think we, we actually, though, have come to think of, I, I just, 
that one of the things, I go to meetings and we hear real world evidence and it's like the panacea. It's like the <laughs> drug that's gonna cure everything. And I hate to give everyone uh, the equivalent of, of naloxone and cause withdrawal. Um, the, the issue is we actually think that for real world evidence, for it to be done right, it's gonna have to be done rigorously. People are gonna have to come in right, yeah. and understand what types of data. They'll have to have a discussion of what you're gonna collect, how you're gonna get there, it, I think we can actually ease, it, 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 may, it may decrease the cost significantly of data collection, but I still think it's gonna have to be well thought out. What I think we, we, we can, what you can't do with real world evidence is just go and try to look at all the different parameters you can collect and then try to find some endpoint after the fact, because if you look statistically at the degrees of freedom, you, you're gonna, you know, we're gonna end up with, with, with false, false positives um, and false negatives. So I think point really well taken. We really want to help uh, people use real world evidence. I wasn't trying to put a wet blanket on real world evidence. I just, I just want to think, think about it realistically that just like all the other endeavors that we have in, 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 in drug development has to be well thought out, well considered, and when it's done well, I think it's going to let us um, expand things. I think in the oncology world now in drugs, it's, it's, it's gotten there where you can put together a protocol to get expanded indications um, and we have pilot programs that'll, that I think will facilitate that. And I think it could come in this world pretty quickly. I just want to thank all of our excellent speakers today for their engagement and transparency and helping us to move um, the regulatory bar here. So we'll continue to work with you and looking very much forward to it. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you.